Hi, so my name's Adrian Cassidy. I'm the CEO of Ludum. Um, and you, we've had a series of videos done by Martin Cross in Crossy's Corner. And we thought we'd spend a bit of time and go through some of maybe Martin's crews. So today we've got all the members of his crew from the Moscow Olympics 1980. So the, the boycott Olympics. And we've got all four of the guys here with us today. And we're just gonna have a conversation around what rowing was like in those days, how the crew developed and maybe some stories of what went on in those long time ago now. And also see what they still keep in touch a lot now today. So see how that, what that means to them. So if you guys want to introduce yourself first, that'd be good. So let me know, this is the British rowing Coxus 4 from the 1980 Moscow Olympics, bronze medalists. Yeah, so um, hi, I'm Crossy, Martin Cross, and I sat at stroke in the crew from when it started in juniors um, to when uh, we did the Moscow Olympics. And um, most people know me now not because of what I did in Olympics and stuff, but because I do commentary for world rowing. So they recognize my voice. You might too. That's me. David? Uh, hi, I'm David Townsend. I sat behind Martin at three, <laughs> trying to calm him down all the time. Uh, I joined the crew in the winter of uh, 1977. Uh, after they had, after the rest of the crew had been uh, to the World Championships in Amsterdam, do I recall? Uh, yeah. And I joined them then when the, the then three man decided he couldn't work with them anymore. <laughs> and you only lasted three years as well. And I last, I lasted three years. Yeah. John, um, I rode a bow in the Moscow Four. Bow and steered it. Um, I was always at bow steering it, except for the winter when I used to do the donkey work while Martin. <laughs> was um, I was one of the. I was actually in it with Ian before the four started in '75, and Martin then joined us, um, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. And uh, Ian McNuff, I was at two in the uh, Coxes four um, and started my rowing with. John, we weren't at the same school in the same year. We weren't in the same class, but um, uh, yeah, we started as um, 14, 15 year olds and uh, rode together right the way through to um, Moscow and slightly beyond. So the, so the two of you were to start the four. When did Martin come in and how did that go about? Mm -hmm. um, we, we raced in 1974 in a, in a four. Um, when we were the, the first year of us being juniors, and there was Ian, I, I was yeah, there was Ian, myself, Robin Roberts, um, who was a key figure, and someone else from our year at school, and we came second at the national championships uh, behind Radley, and so we missed out on international selection for the world junior championships, but we did get selected for the the um, home countries international. Um, and the same year as in that same year, Martin did the same. He came second in the Coxless pairs with someone called Derek Bond um, from his school. Um, and I don't know if you went to the home countries or not, but but, but he just missed out on junior selection. Um, and there were three of us, Ian, myself, and Robin Roberts, who were well but better than the others in our year. And Martin's pairs partner. Um, was, although the same school year was only a one year junior, and so Martin had no one to row with. And um, we took him in under our wing, and, um, and, uh, and then we rode together thereafter. And and, and the, 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 the story goes they thought they were getting the stroke man, not me, because I was at bow, <laughs> and they were really pissed off when I turned up at the Ealing Boathouse. <laughs> Who is that guy? We thought we were getting the good one. <laughs> well, it's absolutely true because Derek Bond was September first, and Martin's July, so he's a year older than Martin. He was stronger than Martin in that pair. I'm sure Martin w would agree. Um, and David Tanner was under the impression that it was the stroke man that we were getting. And it wasn't until Martin turned up in September that David said to us, "We've got the wrong one." <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think it's, a, it's it's quite a good reflection of the sophistication of selection procedures <laughs> in the era that we were in. 
Um, well, it I, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure David got slightly better at naming and recognising athletes as he went on. <laughs> yeah, you learn from your you learn from your mistakes, I guess, don't you? Yeah, exactly. So, so you guys then started doing the four together. So that was a mixture of Ealing School and what was the other school? Cardinal Vaughan. Cardinal Vaughan. And where did you train from? Um, where did what? Say again, Adrian. Where, where did we train? Where did you train? Well, we trained from the boathouse um, right next to Barnes Bridge. You've got Emmanuel on one, all on the same side of the river, on the north side of the river. You've got Emmanuel on one side of the railway bridge, and the other side of the railway bridge, still on the north shore, is uh, where Thames Tradesmen are now. And we were in that boathouse. So, so you guys came together as a four. David Tanner was coaching you, and then you, I guess you went to the Junior Worlds that year. Yeah, just, yes. just on the David Tanner point, he when he first started coaching Ian and myself, we were J15s, and it was David Tanner's first teaching job, and we were the first crew that he coached. Um, and he was, I think, a 22-year-old in his first job, and he saw us right the way through, and taught us how to row, and was learning as as we were learning. He was probably just one step ahead. In, in what he was learning all the way through. Yeah. We, won everything. we won everything in the junior year, should say. It was it was probably, I think, one of the most successful years I've ever had in rowing. Yeah, it was amazing, wasn't it? We, we were racing elite fours all over the place, weren't we? Um, and, yeah, we, we had a lot of fun and, and a lot of success. Yeah, it was very good. So then how do you transition from doing the junior stuff to then going to the senior team? Because at the moment, people have to leave school, go to a club or a university, and then do the whole trials process. But you guys managed to stay as a four. So how does that work? Well, I, th I think a, a, a couple of things, Adrian. I just, uh, firstly, can I, I just put a, um, you know, a, a slight shout out to uh, the, the member of that four that's no longer with us, sadly, Robin Roberts. Um, who, as John quite rightly said, was uh, I think uh, the best, the best of the four of us. To be honest, um, he's sadly no longer with us, but he was a, a fantastic presence in that boat, um, and was a big contributor to the success we had as um, as 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 juniors. Um, and on, um, he he probably. Um, he would, he found it difficult to w w want to continue to train. So when the, after we'd done the junior year, in the in terms of what you're talking about with transition, uh, he didn't particularly enjoy the winter training. He loved the rowing and the racing. Um, so we we were left as a three, and I think that the three of us were sort of really keen, enthusiastic, just wanting to do more. Partly off the fact that we'd had such a great. Uh, a great enjoyable year we we not only won all, all the regattas we've been at we won at Henley we won the visitors in 75 um, and we also okay we got a silver at the Worlds but um, you know we, we felt as we uh, paddled up to the start in our in our wooden our wooden Sims boat uh, against all these wonderful plastic looking things um, we, we had a thoroughly fantastic championship so so as a platform for going on for the following year uh it was a bit of a no-brainer really and yeah we, we 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 need we just had to find um a fourth person and it, it, in that process because of our success we we could basically pick what we wanted to do rather than what the system asked us to do um so we 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 picked our club although i think there was some um discussions with other clubs i mean the others might remember this we ended up at london but they were very um gracious and sensible i would say in saying well you can you can have your own boat we'll sort you out with a boat you will sort you can be your own crew just crack on which was uh i would i would say pretty far-sighted of them to be honest because we wanted to row together that's amazing there are people that let you do that yeah, I think we did have an alternative offer from another club, <laughs> and the let, let's just say the offer was that um, probably we would do well to have a year or two in their second eight just to learn what we should be doing, 
and then we'd see how it goes. Um, I can't remember how the vote went on that one, but I think it was quite, <laughs> it was quite short and brutal. Um, we have all votes here. David Tanner said no. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So you got to, so you got to stay in London instead of moving out to Oxfordshire then? Uh, no, no, it wasn't. It was another London club, to be honest. I think it was uh, Thames. Okay. All right. It was Thames. Um, yeah, it was Thames. Yeah, no. No, we, 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 we... Going back to Robin, what was crucial about... What, we, we all sat in the seats that we sat in in Moscow, so, and Robin sat in the three seats. And what we discovered in our time in that fall, which was over a, a, quite a long period, was that what we needed as a combination was a certain type of three man. And as you'll find out later in the discussion, um, Dave fitted the bill perfectly. But, um, but, but the intervening years, which we'll probably talk about, the, the two years after juniors and before Dave came in, um, we didn't have that the, the three man rowing the way that we needed the three man. It was me that moved from bow to three, and Derek Bond came in, who drove with Martin previously in that in that Coxes pair as a junior. He came in and went to bow, and I went to three. But it was w w what we later found out was that um, the crucial thing was was having a certain type of person behind Martin, which and Dave <laughs> and, and Dave will so, explain what was required. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so uh, let's go. So what is the requirement of the three man to back up the Martin Cross? Uh, got to row, got to row really long. Uh, have a very good finish. Um, calm and um, more introverted than my extrovert, and um, be prepared to take a lot of crap that I used to talk, and um, and just. Don't let it don't let it affect performance. Okay, <laughs> is that how you see it, David? Just slowing down. Just stop <laughs> rushing up the slide. I mean, it's very simple. Just slow down a bit. <laughs> so, so, well, you, so I, how, I, how, I think what you did. I think the difference Dave and Robin made was that they made sure they finished every stroke. When I went to three, it, if I had any skill, it was that I could I could mirror what was going on in front of me. So I was, I was always quite compatible in a pair if I rode up bow in a pair. And when I rode behind Martin, when he started clipping the finish a bit and wanting to get up that slide to to hit that next catch, I I, I would move with him. Whereas someone like Dave or Robin would sit back and say, "No, we've got to finish this stroke," and, and would and would just make sure it was finished before Martin hit those tracks to go forward. I'm getting a reputation here. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it, yeah. yeah Do you think that's fair, that's Dave? I think that's completely fair, John. I think that's completely fair, yeah. yeah. So, so how, did it go about, how did you go about getting in? So, David, how did you go about getting into the four? How did that work out? Because you were the only returning Olympian, weren't you, when it came to Moscow? You were the only one who'd been to the Olympics. An exhaustive selection procedure. It wasn't. It was just begging lessons. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, I, I've had a. I'd been to Moscow and had a uh, not very successful time. Didn't, didn't achieve the results we wanted to. Montreal, Montreal. I think you meant Montreal, Dave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, just to get that one clear. Now. It's a long time ago now, and. Uh, I think I, I would have felt dissatisfied if I hadn't continued rowing. And in 1976, the national squad was under Bob Janacek and ran very tightly, quite a small group, and the organization structure was clear. Um, after uh, Montreal, when Bob Janacek gave up being chief coach and went off to found a boat building company, Carbocraft, um, the, the, the structure was less clear um, and it was clear that private armies were going to re-emerge. And from my perspective, uh, David Tanner's private army was the strongest. <laughs> Some irony there, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
So, so basically, you just went down and trained with them, and then just tried to make sure that nobody beat you. As simple as that, was it? I, I, there was no one else. No one else would go, Adrian. I don't think. I think it was uh, me or nobody. Else. Yeah, you were brave. I've got to say. That's not true. We started off with Derek still in it, didn't we? What wasn't Derek still there? Wasn't there a squad of six of us? No, 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 no. no. Derek, Derek announced his retirement in the gym one night when we used to train at Cardinal Vaughan and then yeah. there, there was basically just the, the three of us and, oh, okay. and I, I knew Dave was kind of you know still fit um, and, uh, and kind of went to proposition him basically at the behest of David Tanner presumably yeah, well, I talked to Dave because I said to David, you know, there's this guy. Um, I'm not sure how well David knew Dave Townsend at the time. Not but he all, soon, he, yeah, he soon got to know him. <laughs> so, and when David joined the fort, was it, was it an instant impact? Was the boat more competitive straight away? Or did it well, take a while to gel? When you say straight away, within a month, I think I'm right in saying, Dave came off his motorbike and was, <laughs> um, and was then out of the boat for, I don't know, six weeks, Dave, would it be? I think, yeah, I think that's uh, probably longer, probably longer. Yeah, yeah but, but what we had in that year after Amsterdam, so it, September 77 would have been when Dave joined us, the World Championships were in Karapiro, New Zealand that following year in 78 and so they were in October which was you know something like 13 14 months away so what we decided to do as a sort of mental exercise keepers interested was we spent a lot of time in a quad do you remember that yeah. a lot of smiling and we were in in a quad ah they got injured very quickly and then we spent a lot of time with David Grammont who was an expert at Rhodes at Tideway Scholars um, and was our Ian and my geography teacher at school and he was probably about 40 at the time could row both sides could scull very well and so he was our he was in the boat more than Dave for that year <laughs> with him. But, but, but to be serious David Grandma was in the boat virtually all of that um, autumn the, the first few months leading up to that Christmas when we were in the quad um, I'd forgotten that I'd forgotten all that yeah, and we used to go out sculling boats a lot. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah talk, talk to us about your sculling, John. <laughs> you know what? I, I always had this strange thing that I would be sculling along, and suddenly I'd realise that I'd stopped and that I'd just lost interest, or or I'd eased off. Yeah. It, it, it was really yeah. I struggled with sculling. I think we all did really a bit. But anyway, I just wanted to point out that, that that little action that John made there, that sculling action where he stopped for about half an hour at the back, that, 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 that is how he sculled. Right, I'd just like to say in my defence, I'm unbeaten in a, in a sculling races. I've raced one, 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 which was the Weybridge Silver Bowl with Richard Stanhope in a double. <laughs> but but right. surely, surely, John, that means you are way ahead of your time. Everybody else is stopping nowadays. So you're way ahead of your time. Yeah, yeah. there you are. You yeah. So the 77 season then, you guys went to some races. And I mean, obviously, the World Cup circuit didn't exist. So you just went to Germany, German regattas, I guess. And then the World Championships in Carapiro. World Championships in Amsterdam, yes. We, we, we did try. We tried for the Olympics, didn't we, in 76? Um, yeah, and we're just not quick enough. We got beaten by the the Coxless for um, oh, it would have been Davis for presumably. That's and correct. there was a, and there was a tradesman for with Chad Roberts, Tony Mallin, Steve Simpole, and um, Milligan in it that also beat us. So we were the third fastest in the country. So our Olympic ambitions didn't quite come right the year after juniors. That was seventy six. Um, then 77, we did get selected for Amsterdam. And this is with um, Derek Bond in the crew. And at Amsterdam, yeah. we we ended up 10th. Okay, so then David comes in that winter and then falls off his bike. And then the next racing season, through to Carapiro, how did things go? 
I think I think generally that a couple of things came together quite well there. I mean, fit, uh, certainly I, I felt fit physically and physiologically, you know, we were coming on being sort of um, sort of out of juniors, truly into seniors at sort of, um, you know, 20, 21 type age. You're starting to um, I, I didn't really notice much difference in the winter, but certainly when we started to do any sort of trials or races, uh, the, the the boat felt much more powerful all round, and I mean, you know, it, I'd like to say Dave had something to do with that, but um, <laughs> uh, you know, clear, clear, clearly he did. But 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 the rest of us had come on physiologically, I think, quite 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 a bit. And um, I remember talking to one of the people we used to race, who um, who said uh, they raced us the year before. I won't say who they raced us the year before and beat us. And uh, he said to me, I absolutely don't fancy racing you this year because I think you're just going to wipe the floor with us, uh, which we did. Uh, and I think that was literally physical, decent physiological development, bringing in Dave, that the, the boat started to feel as though we could go to European regattas. And I, I'll just say be competitive, you know, at the, uh, with, with, with virtually anybody. Uh, and and that that was a big boost, I think. Yeah, the, the we could be anyone from Germany, um, which was a big turn up. I think any of the German crews because they were quite fast. So yeah. we go to you know Mannheim or um, Salzgitter, those those kind of regattas that were on the circuit, and we were beating everyone from Western Europe, which was like, whoa, you know that's that's pretty cool. And giving a decent race to less good Iron Curtain crews like the Czechs or um, we've beaten the Bulgarians, uh, giving a good race to the Romanians. So, so really, we, we kind of positioned that we might go to – what did we do that? Was it our aim to get into the final of that year, the World Championship? Yes, it was. That, that was the aim. The, the aim was set for 77 we were 10 the aim the aim for 78 was to make the final and then it was up to the olympics to say well how far can you push on but it was a final place in carapira that 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 was the aim for that year and i i, I and one, of the, it, one, one of my one of my memories is racing the first serious race we had was in Mannheim, and i think we lost to the top i can't really remember but the Czechs had done very well in the World Championships the year before in 77, I think getting a, a medal of some description. And I remember thinking at the end of that race, right, we're close enough to the Czechs, but not only can we get in the final, but we can win a medal. And that was a that was a really big realisation. So what impact did that have on how you trained from then through to the Worlds, if you suddenly had this confidence? Um, I, well, I, I think for me, I, I'd, I'd probably, um, you know, Dave probably sees it a bit differently. I, I am um, looking back. I, I find myself, if you know, one should always sort of hold the mirror up. Really, um, I, I found myself sort of quite. Um, I, I think generally we, we we trained hard for what we did. I mean, every session I I, I trained as hard as I could. I had a discussion actually quite recently about training volumes and you were, you were talking about that earlier. We, we, we were probably on a volume of what I, I discussed with um, one of the very recent successful squad members of training uh, what we ended up defining as um, the time each week you'd be with a raised heart rate, we called it. Um, we, 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 we were training 50 to 60 percent what they did now. Um, by that measure but actually what we did in those times was pretty much all quite intense yeah. so it, it it was not polarized around really steady paddling and then some speed work it was a sort of what i call a bit a bit in the middle everything everything was hard um that's what they call sweet, they call sweet spot training now don't they yeah that's right so it's sort of most of the training was around and, and i i, I use the gym i use you know everything was around that you just went hard at everything and um you know it, 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 it looking back on it there were periods where you know each of us was you know would just describe it as i feel a bit knackered well it's hardly <laughs> 
<laughs> it's hardly it's hardly surprising if you follow a regime like that um but but uh it was quite quite interesting but in terms of confidence for training now I, I i i personally i was still you know pretty young i loved my rowing i tried to pull every stroke as hard as i could and i didn't really have a lot of expectations out of um uh the the, the sort of summer season in, in 78 and go to carapira other than i thought that the boat was going you know we were definitely quicker than the previous year i didn't know by how much but we were going faster so all things being equal we would come up the rankings and um you know, so 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 it proved, but I, I didn't know how fast. Or, or... So, where did you finish in seventy eight? Well, that was a story. I think the the first heat was was the thing because we were racing the Russians who had beaten the East Germans, who were the reigning world champions that season. So, you know, basically uh, there was one through straight to the final from that heat, and and it was obviously going to be the Russians. And so, you know, uh, we went off the start and there was, I don't know, uh, maybe the French or the Germans or whoever else. Um, and, and um, you know, I think, I don't know if anyone remembers looking across at 500 and seeing we're in first place. And the Russians were nowhere. And basically, uh, we maintained first place for the whole of the race. And so we went straight to the final. The Russians were obviously doing something messing around and wanted to go through the repechage for some reason but it was completely unplanned because i remember asking david tanner you know um what are we going to do tomorrow what's the session tomorrow and he didn't answer because he hadn't planned it because he, he had planned that we'd race the repechage so we'd already exceeded our expectations in that in that first heat and then the, the final, though, was something different. I think you remember, Dave, looking across, that the Russians just shut off. And you remember, Dave, looking across, not aware the Russians had shut off. And we were ahead of the East Germans and thinking, bloody hell, we're leading the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they'd adopted different tactics on the final than they did in the heat. That's definitely yeah. true. I, I, can, I can say, Adrian, after that first heat, I, I, it dawned on me that we were in the, we're in with a shout for a medal here. No matter what was going, we, we were going well enough for that. And that, that was, that, that was my realization point to say, okay, we're in the final, but actually, <laughs> let's rewrite, let's rewrite the aim for the year because that, that is, we, we, we can definitely get a medal here because you just looked at the times and looked at the other crews and looked and thought, do you know what? I, I think, well, that's, that was my feeling. We're, we're in with a shout here which obviously was pr pretty motivating when you expect to, you know, possibly be not, not, not quite there. Um, that, that, that was a bit of a breakthrough, really, that, that particular race and that heat. And it's interesting that you guys talk about it because all you're talking about is Eastern Bloc countries. And oh, nowadays, yeah. no, we, you, you wouldn't be talking about Eastern Bloc countries necessarily. No. I, I mean, I think in, in our era, um, so, so, some... Some things sustain, you know, the Americans since, um, you know, the War of Independence always go for an eight as their first boat. Um, you know, it's just like there are certain things, but really we, 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 we never, yeah, all, all our real racing was always against Eastern Bloc. They were the ones that we had to try and beat and, you know, we beat some of them and we got beaten by others. Um, in fact, in, those, in the three years leading up to the Olympics, I don't think we lost to a Western crew. No. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that we didn't lose to a Western crew. I guess we're, we're, the we're in the last boycott is, is, well, it was very comforting but, but because the, all the crews that had ever beaten us or come close to beating us, probably with the exception of the Swiss, who were very fast uh, only in the Olympic year in 1980, but, but there was no other Western crew that got close to us. And so the boycott actually made absolutely no difference to our particular event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was probably w one of the few events at those Olympics w where that's true. So I guess the first thing people are going to think, oh, it's all drugs. But actually, all those Eastern Bloc countries, they were better organized. They probably did more of the polarized training, especially Eastern East Germans. Yeah. And they were professional, yeah. weren't they? So that's yeah, I mean... 
yeah, yeah, that they trained better. That their their selection of individuals was probably more scientific, so they got the right people into the right sports. Um, plus the drugs. That's you know those are, are pretty big factors building up against you. So how do you? Uh, so I mean, that's another example. Yeah, you go on, David. What you remember is that all of us were working. You know, we, we had essentially full-time jobs um probably with a little bit of latitude uh and uh yeah our, our knowledge of training was not nearly as of how to train is not nearly as strong as it is today so and as uh i think the guys have already mentioned you know david tanner had only started coaching a couple of years before off the back of some interest in rowing with no kind of physiological or coaching training so it, it really was a pretty, I don't want to say it was an amateur setup because actually it was run very professionally by David, but it, it, you know, we were all finding our way. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. And I, I, I think one of the things, you know, cause we, we've talked a lot about racing in, um, in, in the year 78 to 80, but when we got that first bronze medal in um, 78, which was incredible, um, there, there was never a, a sort of sense of how we're going to make up the gap to the Russians who won that championships. Um, you know, what do we need to do? There was, there was, this is what we do, a, a kind of training block and we can kind of tinker around to make it better, which David did. But I think it's, it's you, Ian, the saying, you know, if, if we just sat down and David had said, right, you now need to train sort of 16, 17 sessions a week. Yeah um and that that's what you need to do to be good and to have a chance of yeah. you know winning gold at, at the, the moscow olympics but we we never never even had that discussion no i think i think that's uh i mean you know it, it's always great to look back with a bit not, not only with a bit of nostalgia but also to say well what what might we have done differently and obviously we've all got a phd in hindsight which is great but that that particular discussion of through through the fact that we, we we just didn't know enough and also i would say again i i it's always good to hold the mirror up on these things i never asked that question i just and in some ways the strength of what we did of just saying here's the program get on and train hard was good but in other senses we were we were into the real arenas of, of amateurs compared to some systems that had worked out the kind of volumes and and it had been quite true if someone had said to me look ian you you're a decent rower but you're quite small uh you're going to have to pull your nuts off to uh move up the bit you you need to train 50 percent more times i i would have absolutely gone and done it yeah um uh now i wouldn't have questioned it much i'd have just said right well i've got to do that then so i've got to go out for twice as long as twice I'm not saying we'd have ended up any, any we might not have ended up any quicker, but but it, it, we, we were not following the type of um, system that the East Germans were following in terms of training volumes. And, and they, they, they seem to win quite a lot. Let's put it that way. Um, well, I mean, I um, we never, but the world never became really aware of what those training methodologies were until the, the, the wall came down and all the East German coaches came yeah. to the West. I think that's when the West realised what they were doing. Yeah, yeah. And, well, and of course, we had a pretty also, good idea. Well, the, the other thing to remember is that at the time, the number of medals that GB won at any particular Olympics was probably, you know, in single figures. And so, actually, the, there was just no expectation from, not only from within us, but from the country at large are doing much better than that yeah um, I, I, I remember adrian in um i think it was 1980 and i think i've got the the, the the paper clipping somewhere you used to get something called sports aid and um uh it, for, for the olympics i think i'm right in saying there were only 11 there were only 11 or might have been 13 athletes in the total moscow team of all sports that got sports aid I think six of those were rowers and we, we were one of those six. Um, so in terms of the, the, the transformation through funding to allow certain things to happen, I, 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 look on, I look on that and smile, you know, it's like 
the total package was like 35 grand for these 13 people or whatever it was. I can't remember. <laughs> and we we did growing really well out of it. I think it was it was our four and and, and Clark and Bailey were the other two. Um, so six of the 13, I think, were were, were, were were rowers. And it was all around this thing of saying, oh, blimey, these, these people have got a bit of a shot of medal. How unusual is that? Um, yeah. So so it, it was, it, it, when you see these snippets of information, it's quite interesting how, how far things have come now with, with you know, how, how different it is. But, but hey, and that's... What, and what difference did that money make to you guys? Would it allow you to do differently or better? Never saw a penny of it, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think I, I think it. it, it, it went to training camps, didn't it? Yeah. David David seemed to have a fine wine cellar. No, not at all. I, I think it was basically <laughs> training camps. You know, we, we we did get on on some training camps, and that's great. You know, that, that obviously helps. And um, uh, yeah, it, it's on a completely different scale now. But but um, well, we yeah. also had the, the, the vouchers from Dewhurst the butchers, didn't we? So we could that's get, it, yeah. get get a steak a week or something like that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, I mean, I know some of the other British crews, years after you had conversations around, and it might be the crew you were on the ground, you know, we're getting beaten by the Eastern Europeans. If we want to win, we probably have to take drugs we want to. I guess that conversation never came in with you guys. No, I, 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 no. I, I, never, I never remember having, no, well, I, I, I never had a conversation about anything like that. And for, for me at the time, the, the, the drugs thing was sort of there and known about. There was one regatta, I think it was Mannheim. I mean, Martin will, yeah, will know it. Was. I think it was Mannheim where, where we were beaten by the Russians. Miraculously, one of them failed a drugs test after that regatta. They, they got stripped of their medals. Uh, the one guy that was caught was banned from Moscow, so didn't race. And we got sent the medals in the post about yeah. six weeks later. Um. <sighs> Now the the other three guys in the crew just rocked on and they got someone else off the factory to um, uh, to, to race in in Moscow. Uh, but even with that going, blimey, you've this crew's been tested. I mean, God knows how they cocked up their whatever they do, but they, they did and they got caught. Um, it, it never really re registered with me as a, as a as as a thing to worry about. All I worried about was trying to go as hard as I could, really. And amazingly, that the Russian that was banned, that got caught at Mannheim, was in Moscow, and he was around the crew most of the time. So he wasn't in disgrace. He was just... Uh, yeah. The, in fact, the regime was probably apologetic that they'd messed it up for him. So, I mean, it's interesting, because that you guys, the way you talk about the medals you won, and then getting the medal in Moscow, and the people that be you probably were taking stuff. Do you feel like you're robbed of something or not? No, no, I, no, I don't. No. You know, no. So no. Personally, no. I, I think it's two oh. things. I yeah, go on, Dave. You, sorry, you get asked the question, you know, occasionally. Should don't you want the gold medal? No. You know, I if if I'd won the gold medal at the time, fantastic. But as far as I'm concerned, we had a great time. We did the best we could. We knew what the deal was when we were racing. We were probably rather naive about it. I'd be within. But I had a great time. Yeah. You know, why would I want something different? Yeah, and, and that, that is exactly how I, I see it. Um, you know, I, 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 I know people, Adrian. I meet people who are in similar situations. And you can tell in discussions with them, they still agonize over being robbed or being yeah. denied something. I mean, who knows what would have happened had yeah. these crews not been on. All I can say is they were big, strong crews that rode bloody well. Um, you know, we, 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 you know, the, you can't say you would have won it. And very much like Dave, I, I'm very proud of what we did, how we trained, what we had, a, you know, and what we came away with. I can put my hand on my heart as my favorite quip when people say yeah but did you take drugs and i say well the big the biggest drug i had was a, a full breakfast at greasy pete's in putney <laughs> <laughs> um, now on, only i know that but i am i am at ease with myself because i know i didn't take anything and i did the best i could at the time as we all did david included you know 
Yeah, we, we'd have done things differently now, but hey, that, that's gone. There's other things in life. So you guys obviously had great experience in this crew and you won some medals and stuff. Um, you all have got to have, you worked during the process and carried on working afterwards. You didn't get a gold medal because in some ways people could say you were robbed of it for, because of your opposition. The transition out of rowing, I mean, you all did it at different stages. Martin carried on for quite a lot longer. Um, compared to today's athletes who, you know, winning is everything. It, it's a job in their eyes, whereas for you guys, it was something you did and you had a job and family probably. What do you think the difference is? Do you think you can, you've enjoy, you can enjoy it more now, enjoyed it more then because it was not win at all cost and not the only thing in your life? I don't, it's a really difficult one. Adrian, I mean, I, I know I've got, um, you know, with with uh, with the three other people on this call that are in my crew and David, I've, I've got um, very, very close and good friends that I absolutely cherish. And we went through something together and those experiences have built that. Um, there were many years where we didn't keep in much touch, but we, we do keep in quite close touch now. Um, and I, I can't think of anything better. Um, all, I, all I would say is, yeah, we, ha, had we done different things, different training, different thing, um, you know, uh, I, I would much prefer to have this than have when I do meet, let's just say, some ex-rowing medalists who talk very disparagingly about their experience, the people they rode with, yeah. even though they were successful. I find that quite sad. Um, because you know this was one of my greatest life's little adventures on the way um and uh you know i look back with it with great great fondness <laughs> i don't we, we don't want to give you the impression that every session was uh roses <laughs> and uh, there, were, there were some arguments i've got to tell you yeah <laughs> yeah but they they, they they never saw it the way i did adrian that was the problem <laughs> Yeah, that must be a real problem. Yeah, it is, you know, Christ. But no, I, think, I think Ian's right that, that we are, well, our situation was not typical in that there wasn't really competition for places. Um, so we, we, we felt like um, a bit like Alex Ferguson <laughs> would say that, you know, the world's against them and, and that unites the team. And, and we always felt that it was us against everybody else. And although, as Dave has alluded to, there were often disagreements. If anyone disagreed with any of the four of us or, you know, in, in a sort of disparaging way, we would pretty quickly unite because we were a pretty strong, well, very strong unit. And, yeah. and I don't think that you get that in, the, in, a, in a wider squad situation. So I think we were very lucky to go through that. And, and there was an element of competition because we we were constantly, as Ian said, every session was was hard. We were in pairs a lot. Um, we were always competing around the um, on weight circuits and those sorts of things. So it was very intense, but it was very bonding as well. Yeah, very lucky. Well, I think Adrian, in some ways, there, there, there are some similarities of, well, I, and I'm only going on talking to current athletes about how they feel about boats and crews. Um, I, I, I had complete trust in these other three that, that when it when it mattered, they would absolutely do do their best, and also that if I was struggling, they'd bail me out. <laughs> now. That, yeah. that that might sound a bit weird, but but that, that's quite a that's quite a, a, a powerful way of and and uh, uh, of being in a crew and a team. And when I talk to current athletes about that, they, they 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 talk about people in their boat the same way, saying, "Well, I completely trust X and Y, no matter what." Um, that's that's a very very unifying thing to say. We're, we're going to do the best we can. Yeah. Um, so, how important has the crew been to you guys since Moscow? Like you said, Ian, for a while you didn't keep in touch because people obviously jobs and families, and you kind of have to focus on your own stuff. But as you kind of your kids are growing up, you come out and you see more of each other. How, what has it meant to each other? 
Well, I, I, I think, you know, an awful lot, really, because, um, you know, the, the three of us, Ian, John and myself, carried on uh, from juniors. So we'd been sort of schoolboys. And to win the bronze medal in Moscow, um, <coughs> you know, basically that was all I ever wanted in rowing, to win an Olympic medal, because, you know, that, that was the, the, the highest thing you think you could do. So um the 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 bonds you have from school and the and what you forge in those in those years where we won you know we won bronze 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 in two world championships and olympics you forge very strong links um and you know certainly compared to crews that i've been in later you know those those links are really important and um as as seen now you know we spend we spend an appreciable amount of time talking about races that we once had and try <laughs> try to re-row them. Yeah. We win every one now, Aid. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Uh, there was one thing, David, you said to me once that the, in terms of the race plan final, you know, you know, sometimes people say, well, we're just put it in the final now, go for gold or nothing. But you said, David, Tanner, you, guys, you basically decided to race to your strength and do your race program, race profile. Yeah, we, 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 we raced, we had a race plan and we followed it. I think I think we were attempting to get from the start to the finish as quickly as we could. And that was about it. I, 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 we, the four of us, have discussed on many occasions uh, that we came to about between 1,000 a, a and 1,500 metres in the final. We went from pretty much near the back to uh, third. And it felt at that stage as though we were catching up with the Russians. But the, to, to, to catch the Russians would have put everything at risk. And I think it's really interesting to talking to us, you know, to the crew 40 years later. I think that there's a sense that we all went actually we don't want to we don't want to risk not getting the bronze by going for the silver now i i'd like to hear what the others said about that but i that that's the sense that i had that the risk of going the the the, the, the effort taken to go for the bronze could have sorry to go to the silver could have just lost us the bronze and that was not a risk worth taking so you guys carry on talking. I think Ian's going to play the video. No, I've, the got the vi I've got the video. Oh, oh, you guys, oh, you right. guys. <laughs> so, you, so do you guys agree with David? Does that sound about right? Yeah, Dave's oh. right. Fourth place was um, were the Czechs who had got exactly the same crew that had got the silver ahead of us the year before. Yeah. Um, but basically, it was the East Germans, Russia, Czech, us that shared the three medals each year. Yeah. And the Czechs had beaten us the previous year, and we beat the Russians in fourth place. Um, and the Czechs were were behind us, and therefore we were vulnerable to to them, you know, coming through and getting the bronze medals. And and I clearly remember what Dave is talking of where the, the Russians were in the, the lane for us, and you could hear them shouting. They were obviously aware that we were closing on them with about um, five fifty or six hundred to go. And we were, uh, and that was when we had to, we had to go. Then, if we'd have gone, if it had been at Henley, two lane race, we'd have just gone berserk at about five fifty, six hundred to go, and you know maybe blown up at the progress board, or or got through them. But as Dave said, it wasn't a risk worth taking. We were quick out there, weren't we? in the first 500 first 250 yeah well, i think if you if you do the analysis of the race we're, we're actually the fastest crew for the first 100 meters and we're the fastest crew in the third 500 um unfortunately we're on the far side by the way yeah unfortunately the other 1400 meters didn't go quite so well <laughs> um but but I, th I think Adrian, it is relevant to say uh, you know our, our mindset of going look we we bluntly got nowhere near the East Germans really we're a good few lengths behind them and and to it so 
you know, we got two bronzes and this was the Olympics. I mean, you know, we, we were on to get another bronze medal. And, and personally, I, I, I openly admit, yeah, I, I, you know, as the guys know, I was dead by 1500 meters. I, I, there was nothing more that, that I felt I'd be capable of doing. You know, we, we were still quite young at this. We, I mean, I think our average age was still 23. At, you know, we, we, we'd done really well. I didn't think it was in us to, 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 to get a better medal at that point. Um, but that's back to the discussion we, we never had. I mean, the Russians and the East Germans have gone and we're, we're struggling along here. But we do have a period where we, we, we dug in and gave it the best shot and basically broke the rest of the field. And then we were it was up to us to, to lose out, really. I think the other thing about racing then was it was it was much more sort of highs, peaks and troughs. So, you know, you'd have efforts in the race where if you were going along at 36, 37, you know, you do a burst at about 38, 39 for about 15 or 20 strokes. And then you'd have a call to go back into your race rhythm, which is not what happens these days in racing. You, you generally, you know, keep at, at one pace close to the red line. So I think coming up in this race, as we go through a thousand, we're about to have uh, a big, big effort, which takes us back on the Russians. But that, yeah. that was something different about racing in that in that time to racing now. But don't you think just being realistic in that you can only win the race you can win. You can't win in every race. I so think that, race I, I think that's right. Win. Yeah, I, I think that's right, Adrian. <laughs> We're in the third 500 here, which is, and we did the fastest 500. We did the fastest third 500 in the race. It was through the yeah. checks and yeah. got to close on the Russians and also from what they blew the doors off in, in that third 500, which isn't true because he was in front of me and he kept going pretty well, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the next like arriving... So what was it like arriving in Moscow, the culture shock of a very Eastern Bloc country, also with the backdrop of, you know, Jimmy Carter and the, the, the boycott of the Olympics? How was the run I into Dave, that with I mean, Dave, the uncertainty Dave, of going? Yeah, I think Dave, Dave sort of led the charge a bit on the, uh, uh, you know, any, any sense of us. I mean, I, I felt very strong. There's no way I'm not going. I mean, but Dave led the sort of the sort of uh, uh, official political type response we made up in the House of Commons, you know, uh, all that that stuff. He'd probably be best to describe it. Well, it, it it was a real lesson for me, just because it turned out there was a small group of journalists who got together and said, "Okay." We need to put stories into the newspaper, and it was a it was a very well organised campaign uh, of uh, every day is going to be a story in the newspaper about how hard people are training and how hard how they need to go to Moscow and the fact that the, the main thing from my perspective was if you wanted to boycott something, then they should do something which actually shows a commitment on the part of the country just saying oh the athletes can't go it is it's pointless it has absolutely no impact no negative impact because uh, you know the, the main, one of the main things about competing in games like this is you talk to people from other countries and that really happens and it happens a lot and and i think that's really really important um and, and so, sorry, I'm just looking at the race at the same time as saying this. But we had we had a very well organised campaign with all sorts of journalists putting stories into into newspapers. And as Ian said, we lobbied in the House of Commons, and and so there was a good spirit around going. Uh, and we thought, you know, the government had no right to stop us from going. They had no ability to stop us from going. The only thing that that they could do was to use moral persuasion. And we said, well, we're not being persuaded. Uh, and and 
in some sense, that was quite unifying. Uh, and the fact that the government was telling us not to go almost made you more determined to go. Yeah. So how come did that, that whole campaign had managed to convince Thatcher and the British government to let the BOA and the British team go? It wasn't there. It, they had no say in it. That's the big thing about the BOA. I mean, there were votes. First of all, individual sports voted. Yeah. Um, and and um, some sports voted not to go. Uh, so... Um, Hockey, uh, sailing, equestrian, and shooting voted not to go. We we yeah. had a big thing with rowing. All the big, you know? all, all the big physical sports. We have yeah. To work on. Um, the Tory sports. So yeah. we had to convince British Rowing or the Amateur Rowing Association, as it then was, to vote to go to the Olympics. And then the British Olympic Association was completely independent of government pressure. It wasn't funded by the government. It raised its own money. Um, and they, once the sports voted to go, then there was a vote at the British Olympic Association and they were very much in favour of going. So uh, whatever the government said didn't have an impact on our British Olympic Association, but it obviously clearly did in America and, you know, uh, Germany um, and it did in New Zealand and, and, you know, other countries. So we were, we were really lucky that... Uh, that people ignored government sort of propaganda and pressures. Um, but you, you, one of the you do see it, Adrian, with, um, with, with, with countries such as the US, those athletes that did not go, there is a sort of seething still after all these years. Um, you can feel it in the way they talk about it, that it, they feel very bitter about it still. And it's yeah. one of the one of the disadvantages of the kind of lottery funding system that yeah. with all the athletes being yeah. paid and all that kind of stuff. If the same thing happened now, you know, if someone tries to say, "Oh, don't go to China for the Winter Olympics," they're not going to have a uh, they're not going to be able to resist because the, the the funding comes from the government. So yeah. in that respect, you sort of suddenly, like you, for a lot of athletes now that are funded, it feels like a job. And you have, although it's your dream, you have less control over it. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as you take the money, you're under someone else's control. And that, so that, that's the double-edged swords of professionalism. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But it is a, I mean, it not only, as I said, when I had this discussion about training volumes, if you added in pure training, what was described as um, <laughs> the salad, which is all the stretching and all the other stuff that's done, and you added in travel time, and you added, you're basically on about a 45 hour week. Yeah. So it is basically a full time job with its strains and stresses and. Yeah, all well, the physical exertions as well. That's what's required yeah. now. Yeah. And you have to be uh, get a salary to be able to afford to do that, basically. Exa it's exactly that. And, and if you look at the age generally, I mean, th these athletes uh, with, with the current system, you move into the system and immediately, or, or the central Caversham type system, immediately get this massive shock of how much is expected of you in terms of the, the volume of training, there's a pattern where performances tail off a bit. People have been good, and suddenly they're in this big pool of 70-plus athletes, all of whom are fantastic athletes. And even to fight your way through that, um, you know, it takes a lot. So they're in it a lot longer, generally. There's a pattern of years and years. So, you know, people are coming out of it at an age when, you know, most of us have had seven to ten years of a career. In the old days, I call it. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, and, and that in itself is a is a challenge for people, and some people find that very very difficult. I, I, yeah, I've done two by the time I was twenty four. Yeah. I mean, that's that's unheard of now. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You 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 guess the, the, the level, You have to be. You have to be better physically, I guess, initially to go now. So it takes exceptional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So would you have me watch that video a bit and see you guys cross the line? How does it feel? Does it bring back really good memories or is it just quite like something that happened and it feels a bit detached? Oh, no, I think, well, for me, as the years go by, my, my nostalgic bullshit <laughs> gets bigger and bigger, Adrian. I mean, no, I absolutely love it because it's, you know, you look, I think as you get, as you well, as I get older, you, you look very, very fondly with all the different adventures you've had in life. And that was a fantastic, that's one of my best adventures ever with these guys. So, uh, no, nothing but, I could watch it. It sounds sad, doesn't it? I could watch it all the time. <laughs> but that's how I feel about it. It's very important to me as part of my life, as are the people that are in that boat. And David, very important. Yeah, but one yeah. overriding emotion for me, which was slightly disappointing, was the um, was it was a feeling of relief and not of um, joy. You know, I'd been thinking about winning an Olympic medal for you know two or three years by that stage, and you know, with all the time and effort that gone into it. And you cross the line, and but and because we were vulnerable to the Czechs and uh, and the others in the race of, of losing that bronze medal, or not gaining the, the bronze medal, the relief was the overriding sensation. And I remember when we were waiting to go in for the medals, thinking, you know, I should be feeling, I should be feeling, I don't know, emotional. I should be feeling really, um, really happy. But it was just, you know, relief. Uh, and I think that's that's a bit of a shame. I think if you can come through, um, if if you ha if you get an unexpected medal, or the medal is better than you expected, then I think that you would have huge elation. Although Martin, well, actually Martin's gold was was expected, um, so he can describe he can describe that at some point. Um, but but yeah, but being on the uh, on the on the red carpet, getting the medals was 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 very memorable. Yeah, but but probably slightly affected by um, when when you see what happened in London with the Olympic medalists, um, when you consider that it was full of um, Russians, most of whom lived in a nearby block of flats, we think, and were told they lived the closest, therefore they had to go and watch the rowing. So there was there wasn't a lot of passion coming from the crowd, um, so the atmosphere wasn't fantastic, but it it was still a special moment. Yeah, I love I love watching that race. I love watching the way you know the East Germans that are on on camera, the way they row with those sort of curved backs, and because you show people today, and they're just like, wow, did people row like that? You know, um, the, way, well, they? the what they attacked it all the way, they were really hitting it quite hard, weren't they? Yeah, they were. They were, in fact, the closest we got to these Germans was the first time we wrote, you know, in 78 World Championships when we got bronze, and then they were a little further away from us in bled, and they were a little further away. It was, you know, it's around about six seconds the, dis the distance to them. But, you know, I feel really proud of the fact we were the fastest third quarter in that race because that's what won us the bronze medal. Yeah. And that was quite a big deal because in that Olympics, such as, you know, with pressure, we, we really cocked up the first heat, something really rotten. It was like our worst race that we'd ever had in the four. So we put ourselves under quite a lot of pressure there. We got beaten by the Romanians who we just didn't think could get near us, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah. And I think this, this age of, for, for, you know, you get into the detail of this, uh, we, we then had to race the repassage. And, <laughs> and they said, actually, it might be a four boat final because of the wind. Oh. So what that meant was when we raced that repassage, we had to win it. Because if we didn't win, we wouldn't be in the final. And that, that repassage was the best row I ever had in this boat. Basically, there was no way from stroke one anyone was going to beat us in that race, and yeah. and it felt like that, and I felt absolutely fantastic in that. So, um, and I think it was that that complete. As I said we had a terrible heat, but that's what I mean about trusting everybody and everybody bringing it right from that race to the having done that race. I, I, I we were really in with a shout. Then that was that 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 was a true reflection of us. But that race was. Fantastic race for us, and we did win it. So if it had been four lanes, we'd have still been there. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, cool. it's, also, it's important to, to note that uh, although we'd won the bronze the two years previously, in, in Bled we'd been beaten by the Czechs who were in the final. Oh, yeah. yeah. There was a new Swiss four who had come along who were made up of a bronze medal winning pair and a bronze medal winning double, I think, who really thought that they were in a, in a out for a, you know, gold or silver kind of medal uh and 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 as ian just said the romanians beat us in the heat so we were a long way from a nail on certainty for the for the medal it, it was uh yeah it, it, it was i remember but Adrian, uh, i think it, it, it it's like every olympic year you know there are three world championships the olympic year everything notches up crews emerge you know it, 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 it i don't think it's any different in our era to now people come out and you suddenly find you you have to be better and stronger it just happens in olympic year for various reasons i don't think i think the pattern's the same now um and also people uh, succumb to the pressure don't they as well yeah abso absolutely right pressure new crews incentives people train more for the olympic year you know i mean there's a whole load of things that now you can see the same pattern um emerging it was exactly the same then for us yeah uh, to, to ian's point that it was always clear to me that i was going to stop rowing after the olympics this was my peak if you like and and i think a lot of people have that mindset i'm continuing until the olympics and i'm giving up yeah, and he managed to finish with a bronze medal. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Cool. So I guess we've come to just over an hour. It's been fascinating, from my point of view. I haven't spoken to you guys before, but actually, as a group listening to you, it's, and it's very clear how much you value each other's each other, basically. So thank you very much for your time. No, thank you. No, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Adrian. Adrian. It is completely clear to me that you know, how important these relationships are. Yeah, you know, forged in uh, in a you know pretty strong foundry. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, agree with that. Okay, okay, we'll end the live. Thanks for your time, mate. Here. Cheers, guys. Thanks yeah. very much.